Thank you, Rodney, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank the Office of Research Support for also co-sponsoring this series. And thank you all for being here today. I have changed the title of this talk ever so slightly. I'm going up to 1927 instead, so it's a small change. But let me start with the good stuff. The 1889 Universal Exposition presented an overwhelming spectacle to the citizens of Paris. Underneath the amazing high technology of the brand new Eiffel Tower, built as a demonstration of France's industrial superiority, elaborate pavilions from nations around the world were arranged for the visual enjoyment of visitors. The cultures of France's colonies were also presented as a spectacle. Art, religion, and people were literally put on display. The French government and the organizers of the exposition worked hard to promote the new colony of Indochina, that's what the French called Southeast Asia, which today uh, is the modern nations of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, using several pavilions, a theater, a restaurant, all collectively staffed with over 200 Vietnamese people shipped to France for that purpose. Cambodian culture was prominently displayed as the Angkor Pagoda. This was supposedly a recreation of the ancient Khmer temple of Angkor Wat, and also there was a new museum in the Trocadero Palace just across the river from the Eiffel Tower. A northern Vietnamese village was recreated, and its Vietnamese staff enacted roles characteristic of everyday life in this newly conquered part of Vietnam. Vietnamese employees pulled rickshaws for Parisian tourists. A restaurant served authentic central Vietnamese food primarily to the Vietnamese staff of the exposition. Vietnamese theater troops performed at specially built venues. Indo-Chinese troops, the Tirailleurs Anamites and the Tirailleurs Tonkinois, appeared as ceremonial guards. A Buddhist shrine built by Vietnamese craftspeople in Vietnam was even transported to Paris and rebuilt piece by piece as the pagoda of great tranquility. Many ordinary Parisians seem to have had a negative response to these displays, much to the disappointment of various French experts on the colony. For example, in a journal called uh, the Revue de l'Exposition Universelle de 1889, the journal of the Universal Exposition of 1889, Paul Bonnetin, who was a novelist who had actually traveled to Vietnam, castigated ignorant and racist French citizens who dismissed and insulted Southeast Asia. In what was a very strongly worded text, he asserted that more French people needed to op have open minds in order to value non-French culture. There was, however, a more positive response, which appeared in Initiation, a mystical occultist journal whose owner, Gérard Ancos, under his pseudonym Papus, waxed enthusiastic about this Buddhist temple. He was thrilled to have the opportunity to meet real Buddhist monks and even succeeded in acquiring an invitation to participate in a ceremony, an honor given to few Europeans. That year, his journal published several articles that described the various Southeast Asian displays on view from an occultist point of view. In 1889, the French government was trying to promote its new colony to an audience largely ignorant of Asia. This would be the first occasion when modernist artists and intellectuals encountered Southeast Asian culture. In 1889, artists immersed in the new movement called Symbolism were the first modernist audience for Southeast Asian culture, and their interest was sparked by theosophical leanings. My presentation today is about the intersections of early modern art, theosophy and its related occultist ideas, and politics. By Symbolism, I'm referring to the art commonly called Post-Impressionism, which is actually an ahistorical and incorrect label for what the artists themselves called Symbolism. Symbolism has been long hard to define, as it, is, as it was very eclectic. But it does represent a turning away from illusionistic representation in painting towards abstraction. As a result, it's been identified for a very long time as an early or proto-modernist art. Now, modernism is one of those key concepts that has multiple definitions depending on what scholarly field one is talking about. In the history of art, my own field, modernism is a vexed concept one where there is no longer any consensus definition. For much, of the last 20th for much of the last century, from the 1920s through the 1970s, modernism was synonymous with a narrow, exclusive, and teleological notion of abstraction, most famously associated with the critic Clement Greenberg. Greenberg's ideas of modernism valorized abstraction and voided completely any sense of culture or politics, instead turning to abstract visual form, describing that as the essence of both art and the modern. 
Greenberg's deliberate voiding of politics was in part a reaction against McCarthyism and other forms of red baiting, but also an extension of Theodore Adorno's Marxian theories of mass culture. Adorno, like Greenberg, believed that abstract art forms, especially music in Adorno's case, were the most important forms of art precisely because they left politics and culture behind, turning inwards instead, concerning themselves with the formal qualities and characteristic of art. However, with the rise of postmodernism in art, specifically the rise of performance-based and conceptual practices, Greenberg's kind of formalism could not sustain itself. It was decisively rejected as artists of the 1960s brought cultural politics back into art, first by protesting the Vietnam War, and second by supporting the counterculture, and later on by turning towards identity politics. My paper today is an attempt to recover and illuminate the cultural politics of early modern art in France, moving away from the formalist claims that, modernis uh, that modernism in art centered on apolitical autonomy in a Greenbergian or Adorno-esque fashion. There may be some truth to this claim in other fields, perhaps in the history of literature, but I defer to my colleagues in the English department on that score. I do not believe, however, we can sustain that claim when we look closely at painting in the 1890s in France. Thus, my argument has implications for how we understand the history of modernism in art, as well as what e we even mean by modernism. I'm seeking to anchor this kind of art in the discourses of its time and explore how visual form communicated cultural politics. I see this early modern art as highly political in nature, even though it may not correspond to partisan debates. As I will discuss, the cultural politics of symbolism in France were intertwined with theosophy and its radically left-wing ideas about the equality of all people. Let me begin by surveying the art historical literature. Although we have, there have been many new studies of theosophy and occultism by historians, very few art historians have addressed the subject. One of the few is Robert Welsh's essay, Sacred Geometry, French Symbolism and Early Abstraction, from this catalog uh, of an exhibition at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Welsh's essay was pioneering in looking at how artists like Gauguin and his followers, like the Nabi, were influenced by theosophical doctrine as well as by politics. More recently, though, Leela Gandhi has reframed theosophy by incorporating it into her study of the politics of friendship called affective communities. Gandhi situates theosophy as one of a range of, whole, of cultural politics that was based on a sense of empathy for others. This is what she calls affective communities, and thus had the potential to radically reconfigure the existing order of identities and hierarchies. She includes a chapter on Annie Bizant, the second head of the Theosophical Society, who is apparently today revered as one of the mothers of Indian independence. It was Bizant's theosophy that led her to fight against British colonialism and racism. And it's Leela Gandhi's book that Rodney Fry and I discussed when we first talked about my participation, possible participation in this uh, humanities exploration. When he told me about his theme, this idea of the wheel and the spokes, this idea of unity in diversity, and the multiple ways there are of knowing, and the multiple ways there are of being human, and the possibilities for finding some universal connection therein, I immediately thought of the work that I have done with this particular book, and I thought it connected perfectly. Now, most of the studies of 19th century art and spirituality center on this fellow here, Josephin Piradon, and his Order of the Rose and Cross. Piradon has loomed large because his group put together a number of artistic salons, art exhibitions, featuring early modern symbolist painters. However, as I will point out later on, Piradon represents an offshoot from mainstream occultism, if you can call this an offshoot, one with hard right politics that put him at odds with theosophy and so many of the symbolist artists. The Theosophical Society was founded in New York in 1875 by Helena Petrovna Blavatskaya, known as Madame Blavatsky, Henry Steele Alcott, and William Kwan Judge. Alcott already had a prominent reputation among spiritualists, which I think we can argue influenced theosophy. Spiritualism was the mania that gripped many people, especially in this country, the mania for communicating with the dead via Ouija boards, seances, mediums, and the like. As a number of historians have demonstrated, including Lynn Sharp, who's over at Whitman College in Walla Walla, not far from here, spiritualism offered a place for women to rise to prominence and leadership positions. Possibly there are even some kinds of proto-feminist practice therein. <laughs> 
this interest in the equality of gender would be an important element in theosophy. Madame Blavatsky claimed that she had been contacted from the afterlife by two ancient Asian, Asian sages who revealed their wisdom to her. She maintained that the world's religions were fundamentally the same and that the same universal precepts could be, could be revealed through a wide-ranging study of them. Among the religious traditions from which she and others drew were Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism, but especially the mystical traditions therein, Neoplatonism, Sufism, and the Kabbalah. You can see in this logo that I pulled off of the Theosophy Society's website a few years ago, the symbols of this syncretism. So you have these interlocking triangles that begin to resemble the Jewish Star of David, this Egyptian Ankh sign, uh, the ancient Hindu symbol of good fortune, which is the swastika before you know, you know who ruined it all for us, and the uh, mystical syllable, the Aum, that one recites when meditating. There's also the snake eating its own tail, the Ouroboros, which is a symbol of infinity. Theosophy was a cultist. Actually, let me rephrase that. Theosophy was esoteric in the sense that it held the belief in secret knowledge available only to the initiated, since only a select few could decipher the symbols, the numbers, and the language that unlocked the hidden information concealed in otherwise mainstream religions. In the 1880s, theosophists made a distinction between esoteric and exoteric knowledge, the former being the secret knowledge available only to themselves, and the latter being ordinary knowledge available to all. Theosophy was not the only form of occultism in vogue at the time. Rosicrucianism began a revival in the late 1860s. Anthroposophy was founded by Rudolf Steiner in the same decade. Spiritualism would continue to fascinate some people. Alchemy, dowsing, magic, traveling on the astral plane, and extrasensory perception also appeared in the pages of occultist journals. Paris was a burgeoning site for these ideas, with many shifting and overlapping groups and magazines. Now, in the context of late 19th century France, Theosophy's vision of the union of East and West was a minority position, generally affiliated with the radical left. One of the most prominent ideas of occultism was the notion that all peoples around the world and all individuals are equal without regard to gender, race, or class. This point was affirmed as fundamental to theosophy in every issue of Madame Blavatsky's official journal in France, The Blue Lotus. Each month, in the inside cover of the magazine, there appeared a list of goals to which the Theosophical Society was working. Under the goals pursued by the Theosophical Society, there are two exoteric, external goals. One, to form the basis of a universal fraternity of humanity without distinction of sex, race, rank, or belief. Number two, to study religions and philosophies, especially those of antiquity and the Orient, in order to de demonstrate that the same truth is hidden under their differences. Now, regarding the first of these two goals here, this was radically left-wing. Only the classical anarchists, uh, such as the sort of anarchism of Peter Kropotkin and Elisir Reclus, held a similar position. Discussing the relationship of theosophy and ultra-left politics, The Blue Lotus, this magazine, affirmed that because theosophy shared so many political ideas with socialism, quote, our conviction is that socialism and theosophy cannot be antagonists. On the contrary, those who ident identify themselves with occultist philosophy must work in the same direction as the socialists, even though their doctrines seem the most materialistic. Theosophy, of course, aimed at the spiritual enlightenment of the world and preferred the immaterial to the material. Similarly, there was another magazine called uh, The Review of High Studies, La Revue des Hautes Études, which was committed to human equality and stood against bigotry from the very first issue in 1886. René Caillet, the director of the journal, published an article condemning Édouard Drummond, the author of the infamous anti-Semitic book La France Juive, Jewish France. He wrote, quote, to unite all the religions into one based on science, by which, of course, he meant occultism, and the highest aspirations of humanity, to bring together every heart and all people under the same flag, such is our mission. Unquote. Occultism's left-wing politics are also demonstrated by the interventions in the debate between Celtism and Latinism in the late 19th century. As the art historian Mark Antliff has demonstrated from the 1890s onwards, there was a kind of essentializing political debate that sought to locate the sources of French culture, 
in the racialized qualities of a national character. Political conservatives asserted that the culture of France was descended from the Roman Empire. And thus, France's culture was fundamentally Latin and based in the southern regions of the country where you can still find Roman ruins today. Some political leftists, however, argue that the true culture of France lay in the north with the Celtic peoples of the nation. Occultists came down firmly on the Celtic side of the debate. David Allen Harvey, in his study of occultism in France called Beyond Enlightenment, argues that one important strand of occultism called Martinism, which mingled with theosophy in the 1890s, sometimes it's really hard to tell them apart, quite frankly, was actually fundamentally conservative and promoted a vision of society as necessarily hierarchical. Now he is, I will say, partially correct. There was an occultist theory called synarchism, originally developed by Saint-Yves d'Alvedre, which was taken up by some of these occultists, and it did indeed promote a social organization that had a mystical and enlightened elite in control of the masses. But this was only one relatively minor discourse within the larger context. My claim is in part that in the 1880s and 1890s, the left-wing politics of theosophy were dominant. There is one additional important offshoot of this occultism that I want to mention called Esoteric Buddhism. In his book, The Great Initiates, Edouard Chéry argued that the figure of Christ from the Christian tradition and the Buddha were incarnations of the same divinity and that the Buddhism was the source of ancient and secret occultist knowledge. Now, he also drew from Hinduism and Christianity in formulating these ideas. Alfred Percy Sinnott, an early dissident from the Theosophical Society and a competitor of Madame Blavatsky's, argued the same thing in his book called Esoteric Buddhism. Sinnott disagreed with Blavatsky over the importance of Western religion. He asserted that Asian traditions like Buddhism should be the foundation for theosophy, even more than Christianity. Sinnott and Shure caused a mania for Buddhism among occultists around 1890 in Paris. As theosophy began to spread around the same time, many people actually assumed that uh, this esoteric Buddhism was the same thing as theosophy, and Madame Blavatsky herself had to publish articles telling people that no, it wasn't. The height of this mania was around 1890. There were dozens of articles on Buddhism published in dozens of different occultist journals. Many of them took great care to identify and introduce the specific doctrine and various sects of Asian Buddhism as they were understood in Asia, sometimes country by country. The authors showed a surprisingly sophisticated knowledge of Buddhist doctrine, which they gleaned from a variety of sources, including mainstream scholarly ones. Sinnott and Shuri's ideas were characteristic of occultism and this theosophy in one key way. They believed that Europe and Asia, East and West, needed to be brought culturally and religiously together. They rejected the racism and chauvinism of most Europeans at the time, who felt that, of course, their nations and culture were far superior to those backward Asians. Instead, occultists like Chure, Sinnott, Blavatsky, Alcott, etc., believed that Europeans needed to be humble and to learn from the ancient traditions and faiths of the East. Let me go back to Peladon for just a brief moment. The reason that he is marginal to the cultural politics of occultism in general is because he broke with some of these key occultists and turned into a neo-Catholic. Although he was prominent early on in founding the revival of Rosicrucianism in France with Stanislas de Guaita, who was a major figure, Pap um, Peladon broke with de Guaita in 1890. Peladon spl split off to found his own competing Rosicrucian group called the Catholic Order of the Rose and the Cross. And this is in contrast to de Guaita and Papus's organization called the Kabbalistic Order of the Rose and the Cross. Now, lest this sound a little too much like you know, the People's Front of Judea versus the Judean People's Front. Let me just point out that the name of de Guaita's order indicates its syncretic interest in merging religions, much like theosophy. Peladon's, by contrast, points to religious nationalism and probably anti-Semitism. Remember, the Dreyfus Affair was going to explode just a few years after this. And there was another prominent neo-Catholic in Peladon's circle, the symbolist painter Maurice Denis. About 10 years after this painting, Denis would be promoting a racist and xenophobic definition of French nationalism that aimed to expel all non-Catholics from French territory and re-establish the monarchy. I have a very hard time separating Peladon from 
this kind of ultramontanism, which is very far away from the universalizing politics of theosophy. One important thing that these theosophists and occultists did was appropriate and reinterpret academic and museum sources in their quest to learn about Asian religion and culture. Their use of scholarly and official sources parallels their pattern of selectively reading exoteric doctrines to find secret occultist knowledge. For instance, the uh, Theosophical Review in September 1889 recommend that its readers attend an International Congress of Ethnography, specifically so they could learn about Buddhism from major scholars at the time, such as Georges Maspero and Leon Dorosny. Similarly, the opening of the Guinée Museum was eagerly anticipated by these esotericists and theosophists who saw its collection of Asian art as an opportunity to engage directly with Buddhist culture. They eagerly read the museum's publications as well. And I'll just mention that if you are <coughs> visiting Paris and want to go to the Guimet Museum, it's a great show. But I also encourage you to go see the Guimet Museum's annex, which is a few blocks away and really quite nondescript. I have this sense that Emile Guimet, who was a major collector of Asian art, especially Asian religious art, and traveled extensively in Asia with Félix Régamy, uh, the artist, to document these things, was especially interested in trying to teach Europeans about Asian religion and culture. And he gave his collection to the state in order that it could maintain a collection dedicated to Asian religion that was free of charge. Now, of course, the Guimet Museum charges money these days. So I think in order to fulfill the terms of Guimet's bequest, they have to have this annex a little bit further away. And what you find at the Guimet Museum today is completely interlinked with the history of colonialism in France and the efforts to promote colonialism. This piece here, which of course was literally ripped off the walls of a temple, probably in Angkor Wat, was displayed in 1878 at, in the Colonial Expo, uh, the Colonial section of the exposition. That's where I've taken this image from. And it's now the very first thing you find when you walk into the Guimet Museum, at least it was a few years ago when I took this picture. The influence of theosophy led Papus and his friends to develop a politicized, egalitarian, and anti-colonial discourse that was radically opposed to government propaganda, even at the, at the same time as they used official sources to learn about Asian art, religion, and culture. Their belief that the universal divine truth lay hidden in mainstream Buddhism and other religions encouraged them to appropriate and dramatically reinterpret dominant discourse into their own anti-racist worldview. So when the 1889 exposition opened, these occultists were already deeply immersed in Buddhism and thus primed to seek out the Asian culture on display. Their selective reading of religious texts and willingness to appropriate them encouraged them to use this overtly colonial government propaganda for their own purposes. Despite the contradictions inherent in this gesture, the occultists attempted to reinterpret the exposition for their own ends while dissenting from the dominant imperial message. It was July 1889 when Initiation, Papus's magazine, began a series on the Orient at the Exposition. The series would run for three months, and it was Papus himself who wrote the articles. In them, he countered the mainstream notion that the Orient was devoid of civilization. It is, in my opinion, a grave error, he wrote. He chose instead to contrast European and Asian culture, elevating the latter. He described the French Palais de la Guerre, the war pavilion, and a Hindu pavilion that faced it as emblematic of the two cultures in general. The war pavilion, he wrote surrounded by machine guns, cannons, and cannonballs, the only church that the self-proclaimed civilized West could erect to face this Hindu pagoda. He claimed that the Orient had dedicated itself to intellectual and spiritual matters, while the West only focused on material things, and that his own writings were intended to help unite these two complementary forms of human knowledge. It was the third article in the series that introduced the Vietnamese Buddhist pavilion and the private religious service that I mentioned earlier. The exposition continued to appear in the pages of occult journals for a, up to a year after it closed. For instance, in March 1890, also in Papus's magazine, an author specifically cited the exposition as an occasion when people from ostensibly different nations and faiths were able to communicate directly with each other. 
therefore affirming the occultist belief that underneath superficial appearances, all religions are the same. And he wrote, I quote from at the top here, Pythagoras's golden verses begin by proclaiming the unity of faith underneath the diversity of religions. At the exposition of 1889, during the Buddhist mass, through a simple detail of ceremony, Jacques Papus could intelligently exchange signs with the bonzes of Vietnam. And direct exposure to Buddhist monks and their rites occasionally remained possible in Paris even after the exposition closed, much to the delight of Papus and his friends. The Guimet Museum in 1891 had some visiting Buddhist monks. And although it was attended by government ministers and other representatives of the colonial state, the occultists were keenly interested. Now these occultists not only descended from the colonial propaganda of the 1889 exposition, they also directly opposed the larger imperial messages of the exposition in the pages of their magazines. Numerous articles in Initiation, The Veil of Isis, The Blue Lotus, expressed strong criticism of both colonial ideology in general and specific policies in particular. Now I could cite you article after article and detail these directly anti-colonial contents, but I don't want to bore you with a simple list. So for the purposes of brevity, let me just cite a couple of examples. As early as 1888, you have a, a, a journal called The Lotus, criticizing French missionaries in Asia as poor representatives of French civilization because of their racism and their ignorant dismissal of Asian culture. Through the 1890s, Initiation published a regular series of articles on colonial and international issues by an author using a pseudonym, who I haven't been able to figure out his real name. He was, however, very well informed. And these were highly critical of imperialism. For instance, in this article, the author highlighted the old adage that you can either have a democratic country or you can be an empire, but not both, because the empire always comes back home. Quote, each nation tends to identify itself with its people, that is to bring together into a powerful unit all the natural ethnographic diversity, but this can only be achieved through the gross and dangerous fiction of military dictatorship. He's talking about the colonies. In the next column, he condemned France's role in causing a famine in northern Vietnam through trade policies with China. Starvation, he wrote sarcastically. This is how we colonize. This is how we export free trade to the barbarian countries, the great principles of European civilization. Now this spread of occultist ideas helps illuminate what I think is an understudied aspect of Paul Gauguin's art and aesthetics. While his trip to Tahiti is perhaps the best known part of his career, before going to Tahiti, he submitted an application to the French government for an administrative, permission, uh, administrative position and permission to travel to Tonkin in northern Vietnam. Now the question of what he sought to find in Vietnam and why he thought of Vietnam as a site to develop his primitivist fantasies has not been adequately addressed in the scholarly literature. I'm going to suggest that Gauguin had these fantasies of Vietnam that were shaped by occultist ideas of Asian Buddhism as a key source for universal truth. Because it was in 1889, the same year as he wrote that letter asking the French government, that he began to engage with this occultism. According to Robert Welsh, Gauguin was likely introduced to theosophy by Claude-Emile Schiffernecker, one of his friends, <coughs> and Paul Sérisier. As early as 1885, Gauguin was exchanging letters with Schiffernecker where, where the two discussed theosophical symbolism. Gauguin found the 1889 exposition, the same exposition that Papus visited, to be a direct source for several of the so-called primitive culture that inspired his art. He used this exposition to develop his ideas about possible destinations. He probably discovered Vietnam from these displays. We know for a fact from his letters that he was deeply interested in the Javanese pavilion and the visiting Javanese dancers who performed there. It was shortly after attending the exposition that he developed the idea of seeking a government posting in northern Vietnam. In one letter, Gauguin described Vietnam as a place to study oriental culture, which he described as the opposite of what he called the rotten West. He's combining Papus's interpretation of Vietnam with, with his own nascent rejection of Western culture. He even suggested setting up an artist's commune, the idea that he would later call the Studio of the South, that he would try to live in Tahiti. And he described this studio as the kind of basic hut that he had seen at the 1889 exposition. He indicated that his goal was to live like a primitive or a savage life, 
and he may well have been referring to the ersatz Vietnamese or Javanese villages erected for the exposition. This is a photo from a later exposition, but it's very similar, I would hope. When ap applying to travel to Vietnam, Gauguin may have imagined his destination just like these Parisian reconstructions. Now, unfortunately for him, his request fell largely on deaf ears. The government would deny his application. He wrote to his friend, the painter Emile Bernard, with vituperation and condemnation of the government and of the kinds of people it sent to his colonies. He lamented that an insurgent, that's what he called himself, like himself, would never gain the permission of the authorities. But he assured Bernard that despite the official disapproval, they would go to Vietnam. However, he never did. But the rest is history. Now, Gauguin was something of a dilettante when it came to occultism and theosophy. Let's look at some more serious practitioners. There was an artistic journal called Le Coeur, The Heart, co-founded by a prominent occultist and an artist as a voice specifically for the renewal of religious art in general. After Péladon became a neo-Catholic and broke with Papus and de Guaita, it was the influential writer Jules Bois and the artist Antoine de la Rochefoucauld, from the prominent family, who founded this journal. It was distinct among symbolist journals because of its commitment to occultism. It was as much an art journal as it was an occult journal. Bois was the influential author of various books like Satanism and Magic, and he seems to have rivaled de Guaita in terms of his influence. The theosophical ideas were prominent in the pages of Le Coeur from the very first issue. They published excerpts from Madame Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine. This was the book where she described how the ancient sages had come to her from the beyond. And they would con uh, this esoteric Buddhism would continue to appear in the journal's pages. There's an article of 1893, for instance, that discussed the fundamental similarities between Christ and Buddha and cites the Guillemin Museum as the source of their information. Gauguin's friend Schiffenecker wrote a letter to them that was published in an early issue extolling the importance of Buddhism for the renewal of religious art in France. He, quote, he wrote, quote, the flame must be lit again. Christ had lit it in the West. His work is dead, or at least moribund. Who will lift the fallen torch, the flame needed for spirituality? Will it be the Oriental Buddha? Whoever he is, he better hurry, otherwise there will be no art at all." Unquote. Gauguin's followers, the Nabi, were also immersed in occultist ideas. The Nabi were born of late 19th century symbolist primitivism and combined mysticism with aesthetic modernism. There's really a picturesque story you can tell about the origin of this group. One of these groups of young students, only about 18 to 20 years old, studying at the Académie Julien in Paris, which was obviously not a very good academy of art because it accepted women and foreigners, specifically Americans. One of them goes on vacation and happens to meet Gauguin. I think it was at the Pension Gloanec, and painted this painting on a cigar box lid under Gauguin's tutelage. He takes it back to his friends, and they all decide to drop out of art school and become modern artists. This occultism was a profound influence on their early years together. They called themselves the Nabi. Nabi is a word based on the Hebrew and Arabic words for prophet. And it was suggested to them by a friend of theirs who was a scholar of Hebrew. The word Nabi was also used in theosophical circles at around the same time. There was an article by Madame Blavatsky in 1889 who used, uh, where she used the word Nabi to describe what she called the holy people of Israel. Other scholars have suggested it was Edouard Schurey in his book about the great initiates that made the use of this word respectable. Most of these artists were personally immersed in theosophy and occultism. It was Paul Ranson and Paul Serusier who were the most avid devotees. Robert Welsh argues that Gauguin inspired much of this interest in occultism at the same time as the group was influenced by his style. Robert Welsh even suggests that given Gauguin's lack of enthusiasm for the intellectual aspects of theosophy, these guys may have read more occultism into Gauguin's art than Gauguin had actually intended. Paul Ranson here was one of the most enthusiastically interested in this occultism, as you can see from the portrait. This was done by Serrusier of Ranson. Ranson owns copies of several major theosophical and occultist works, Chouret's book, of course, Papus's uh, elementary treatise on occult science, uh, Eliphas Lévy's book on the uh, dogma and ritual of high magic, uh, Jules Bois' Satanism and Magic, for instance. 
By 1893, Paul Ranson was close friends with Jules Bois and submitted uh, art that was published in the magazine Le Coeur. This painting, this portrait, shows Paul Ranson in a way that highlights his fascination with this occultism. It's a little bit of fun, but it does highlight their interest. It shows him dressed as a priest or initiate, consulting an ancient tome, a kind of grimoire, and surrounded by occultist symbols. He is also in a kind of indeterminate space, holding a prominent staff and pointing to this mystical text. There's a kind of large halo, if you will, that appears behind his head. The painting is, of course, stylistically indebted to Gauguin. You have the figure deline delineated with a black outline with very little shading, relatively l flat areas of color, almost no chiaroscuro, therefore suggesting a figure who exists outside of time and space. However, Serrusier has balanced the abstraction of the image with clearly readable representational elements. The painting actually resembles an icon from the Eastern Orthodox tradition, say. Robert Welsh and Madame Janine Méry have argued that there are a lot of specifically theosophical symbols that appear in this portrait. Let me just mention a couple. There are these zodiacal signs for the planets Jupiter and Venus on his collar. The right hand of the artist rests on what is either a pentagram or a hexagram in the book. Madame Méry argues that this bright jewel is specifically the tabula smaragdina, or the tablette des Mérodes, attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, as interpreted by Papus. The large orange disc, she says, could be the light of the word, as explained by Chury. Ronson's paintings of this period were profoundly influenced by his interest in occultism. He made a number of works with these themes that combine this Gauguin-esque style of abstraction with this occultism. This is a piece called uh, Nabi Landscape, also called The Nabi. It shows a bearded figure, possibly the Nabi of the title, in an imaginary landscape rendered with flat planes of brilliant unmodulated color. The central figure here squats on the lower left, surrounded by a kind of irregular mandorla, a kind of whole body halo, if you will, that comes out of the Eastern tradition of Christianity. The other two main figures are the bird in the center and the nude woman riding an imaginary kind of bird in the upper left. Each of these figurative elements is rendered with very little shading, surrounded by a black outline. It seems to float or hover over the background, therefore pushing towards abstraction. The man below here seems to sit on this ground line, which also delineates a separate visual register. It's a little bit hard to see in this reproduction, but inside this register are these flat, abstract floral decorations. The color of the sky up here echoes this visual register, and it therefore evokes the kinds of hieratic, fundamentally abstract representation that you find in ancient Middle Eastern art, specifically ancient Mesopotamian art. But there's still a tension between this abstraction and the perspectival devices, because you see how the foliage gets smaller as it recedes into the background. And of course, this fellow undermines this abstraction of the image because he picks one of these flowers seemingly from the abstract area below. Uh, Madame Méry has analyzed the imagery here. She suggests that the main figure is actually the Hindu god Rama, not some kind of Nabi, who wears a bracelet of the snake eating its own tail. And the figure in the upper right, she suggests, is Sita, the wife of Rama, returning to earth. On the back of this canvas are letters in Arabic that spell out the word Nabi. Overall, what the artist has tried to do here is synthesize Western modes of perspectival representation with the visual forms of so-called primitive art through this Gauguin-esque abstract style. Another of Ronson's painting, Christ and Buddha, 1890, combines symbolist abstraction with the overt influence of occultism and clear references to Southeast Asia. In the foreground is a green-gray seated Buddha of either a Cambodian or a Thai type, as you can tell from the ears and the stupa on the hat. Between the two Buddha faces are five lotus flowers, and behind them is a Christian crucifix, which is ripped off directly from Gauguin's painting, Yellow Christ. The relatively unmodulated and flat areas of color emphasize the abstraction and subvert any possible perspectival face. The forms hover in front of a flattened red and orange background. However, notice around the Christ figure would appear to be clouds turned into praying figures. 
As Robert Welsh has demonstrated, I think quite conclusively, this painting is basically an illustration of Alfred Percy Sinek's book, Esoteric Buddhism, which, like Shure's books of the same period, asserted that Christ and Buddha are the same universal divinity, and that the so-called Occidental and the so-called Oriental cultures are equal and complementary. Welsh also argued that Ranson was influenced by the Cambodian art available in Paris in 1889 at the exposition. That he saw these Cambodian uh, Buddha types either at the colonial displays in the exposition or in the Museum to Cambodian Art that opened in 1889 just across the river from the Eiffel Tower. So what I'm arguing is that in this painting, Ranson's sources for his occultist imagery and subject are the clearest. And therefore, he was attempting to encode the universalizing and utopian interpretation of Asia into this painting, specifically the belief in the cultural and religious equality of Asia and Europe that was so firmly held by occultists like Papus. Ranson combines this spirituality with this kind of arabesque and abstracted visual style characteristic of symbolist painting in general. We know that this painting was important to the artist. He took it with him, he would carry it through the streets to the regular meetings of the group held by Serrusier at a restaurant. He gave the painting the name Nabi Brotherhood, written in Arabic letters on the back, which suggests it held an important meaning for the self-identity of the group, even more than we might assume from such an obviously esoteric Buddhist subject. Now the Brotherhood, referred to by the writing on the back of the painting, might also be this notion of the universal brotherhood of all people, articulated by theosophy. I'm suggesting to you that because this painting overtly quotes this occultist symbolism and spirituality, it is therefore inflected with the oppositional and anti-colonial discourses of esotericism, which viewed all religions and people as equal. Let me now fast forward to consider 1927 and the continuing influence of theosophy and its politics, both on modern art and how we, in terms of how we understand modern art. In the 1920s, long after esoteric Buddhism had basically disappeared, and long after the Theosophical Society had moved its headquarters to India, Emile Antoine Bourdel, a student of Auguste Rodin, famous for the thinker, did a portrait of Jiddu Krishnamurti, the young man hailed here but as a possible messiah by Annie Bezant, the second head of the Theosophical Society. It was she who moved the headquarters of the Theosophical Society to Adyar in India. Krishnamurti was, of course, a prominent spiritual leader in his own right. Bourdel's letters demonstrate he was enthusiastically discussing theosophical ideas much earlier than this, as early as 1905. He was even friends with Jules Bois, founder of Le Coeur magazine. But it was one of Bourdel's own students, Marie Bermont, who had a large influence on him, I, I think. Bermont traveled to India in 1911, directly to visit the Theosophical Society in Adyar. She stayed there for some, from, for some years, writing long letters to Bourdel. And long after her visit, she was known as a Theosophical painter. I think it might have been her who helped Bourdel meet Krishnamurti. One of the results of that meeting was this portrait in bronze. It's an idealized and noble depiction of Krishnamurti. But one of its prominent features is this odd base. You can see the base of the bust here seems to be composed of two triangular planes that seem to be sliding past one another. They resemble these interlocking triangles of the Theosophical Society's logo, which themselves take on the form of a Jewish Star of David. But in this portrait, they may refer to the multiple planes of existence that theosophy describes. The world that we live in, you see, is only one of these planes of existence. On the higher planes, astral travel and telepathy are possible, among other things. However, these triangles also resemble Bourdel's own signature that he used for many years, even before this portrait. You can see how his signature is composed of two forms, like those interlocking triangles, except that one triangle has its bottom folded up, thus resembling right here, there's the letter A, and you turn it on its side, the letter B, so A, B, like Antoine Bourdel. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't really know why he designed his monogram to look like this. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I suspect it holds theosophical or occultist meaning. I'm in the process of developing an argument about Bourdel's work more generally, 
This is his famous Heracles the Archer. This is the version that's in the Bordel Museum in Paris. There are versions in Los Angeles, the Musée d'Orsay, and also one of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where I saw it last year. It's just outside one of the cafes, actually. But here you can see a bit more of Bordel's sculpture around the famous Heracles. And you can see he uses a very kind of 1920s or 1930s stylized classicism. The figure of uh, Hercules here, or Heracles, is very obviously a classical Greco-Roman subject. But what you have with Bordel's art is not the kind of sophisticated classicism that comes to us from the Renaissance through the fine arts academies, the Académie des Beaux-Arts, founded by Louis XIV, all the way into the 19th century. Because remember, the Nabi were dropping out of just one of those kinds of classicizing art academies. Here instead, you have a style of classicism that seems to be even more, quote unquote, primitive, a kind of archaism. I bring up archaism because this is a word that Bordel himself used in conjunction with his friend, Elie Faure, a writer and theorist who wrote a multiple uh, volume series on the history of art. This notion of archaism for Elie Faure was one that he explains in this particular book here that unites all forms of ancient art from all across the world so that we should not simply pay attention to the art from our own nation or from our own continent, but that we can see if we look the kinship of both forms and faith in all the art of all the world, especially when you go back to the ancient period, to the archaic period that fascinated Bourdel so much. And today I've sketched out for you what I think is a key moment of metropolitan French artists' engagement with both Southeast Asian culture and the colonial discourses of their time. My claim is that these symbolist artists early on and their circles became interested in Southeast Asian religion and art, that is both Cambodian and Vietnamese culture, because of their prior interest in theosophy and the related forms of occultism, such as Martinism and esoteric Buddhism. Most of these forms of occultism, like the spiritualism that came before it, promoted ideas of cultural, racial, and gender equality that were extremely left-wing for the time. Now, although these cultural politics are not uncomplicated, I think the historical record is clear. This occultist discourse was both anti-colonial in terms of opposing specific policies of the colonial governments, you can read their words themselves, and undercut the racist chauvinism that was at the center of colonial propaganda. Instead, theosophy imagined an equality of East and West and promoted a utopian vision of global racial and cultural harmony because none of us has a monopoly on the truth. Instead, the deeper truths of both knowledge and faith can only be grasped by humbly learning from one another. A lesson I think that Rodney Fry's scholarship and his humanities exploration have tried to teach us. Thank you. The short answer is yes. I have not looked into Du Bois and the uh, World's Columbian Exposition at all, quite frankly, but a friend of mine has. Now, there's been a lot of great scholarship on expositions unpacking these colonial displays, the discourses that are embodied visually in them, but also looking at the ways that these expositions not only promoted a vision, but you can see that discourse breaking down even in the same exposition, so they're not always received the same way. A friend of mine, a former classmate of mine actually, uh, is a specialist in the Harlem Renaissance, and she has looked specifically at the influence of a fellow named Gurdjieff, who was, was this same kind of kooky, spiritualist, esotericist, talking about universal harmony as well as higher planes, and was right there with Du Bois, etc. I can't tell you much more than that, but the answer to your question is very much yes. <laughs> 
I would completely agree with you that this cultural politics is not uncomplicated, that it is in many ways both racist and anti-racist at the same time. But this is the kind of thing that we should expect, really, in that we cannot expect people to transcend the discourses of their time. And if you look at Said's later book, uh, Cultural and, and Culture and Imperialism, you see him exploring the ways in which colonial ideology or colonial discourse, however you want to call it, permeates a culture all the way to the very center. And so we have this idea coming out of post-colonial studies that the idea of the sort of identity of us and them, or the metropole and the colonies of uh, center and periphery, are mutually constitutive, not just intertwined somewhat, but go all the way down together. You can't have one without the other. And so you have people like Gauguin and others and these uh, esotericists who are buying into many of the ideas of their times, which includes this colonial way of talking about these people being in the past. But at the same time, you find them overtly trying to counter racism and colonial propaganda. So it is a kind of double-edged sword, this kind of gesture of primitivism. The whole notion of primitivism in modern art has been vexed on precisely this question. To what degree are these artists looking at other cultures complicit in this uh, colonial era racism? So my focus is to understand that complexity and to pay attention to what the artists themselves thought they were trying to do in a kind of counter discourse that is embedded in that moment but at the same time still tries to resist the politics of that moment. Does that answer your question? Uh, the new atheism of this 21st century. <clears throat> the short version is I can't answer that question. I don't know that I could say anything about that. But I can tell you about something a little bit different. There is a profound connection with this theosophy and occultism and the new science of the turn of the 20th century. When you look at the discovery of things like x-rays and atomic theory, and you have a very strange moment when the brand new science, like Einstein's relativity, for instance, seemed to be saying a lot of similar things that these occultists were saying. So you find a lot of folks mingling the two. You even have Annie Bazant in India with the Theosophical Society using uh, astral projection and traveling on the astral plane in order to understand the science of the atom. She wrote about the structure of atoms because she traveled on the astral plane to see them. Uh, so you have this profound mingling there. Uh, the atheism is not quite on the radar screen of these particular people. There is atheism at the time. The anarchists, the classical anarchists come out of, say, Kropotkin and others, were profoundly atheist, very rationalist, which is sort of why they didn't get along especially well with these folks, because there is a big gap, even though there's some politics that do um, connect a little bit. Uh, I hope that is a useful answer to your question. How much do you think that these French collaborating that I can't think of off the top of my head that's the one? Um, how much do you think they pulled from earlier French romanticism that was also at that time drawing kind of Christianity towards nature and the industrial revolution was going on? Did they pull from them at all or is there no actual connection between the two groups? There's probably something. I can't answer that question specifically. I mean, it's not so much about French. I don't know enough about the romanticism and the connections therein uh, to this kind of theosophy. I'm not aware of any direct connections. What there are are connections between this sort of revival of occultism in the late 19th century and earlier forms of occultism. So Rosicrucianism going back to what, the 16th century and such, and the whole notion of alchemy, et cetera. There's older forms that would have been there. The mystical traditions that, as far as I know, informed some of these romantic artists I'm thinking of, say, Friedrich, who's painting the sort of uh, forests like the cathedral. So you go into the forest and you can see the crucifix right there or the church rising out of the trees, etc. It's a kind of mystical vision. It, this, that is, shares something with this theosophy in terms of the direct experience of the divine that can be found underneath everyday life. And so there is a link to the mysticism, so Neoplatonism and the other forms of Christian mysticism that I suspect people like these romantics were aware of, 
also influence these folks here. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you all.